Now let's talk about labor and birth complications other than preterm labor. I consider rupture of the membranes to be the point of no return when thinking of labor. We can delay birth for a while once membranes have ruptured, but we are limited by the fact that once membranes rupture, the bacteria from the vagina can now ascend unimpeded into the uterus, cause chorioamnionitis, infections in the fetus, and sepsis. If rupture of the membranes occurs before the infant is mature, we may be able to delay birth long enough to give steroids for lung maturity, and in some cases it is attempted for a longer time than that, but the patient must be monitored closely and delivery allowed at the first sign of infection. The woman will always be in the hospital if it's that serious. In the term pregnancy, we would like for the baby to be born no longer than 24 hours after the rupture of the membranes. I tell my prenatal patients to come to the hospital once rupture of the membranes takes place. They don't have to be in a hurry or call 911, but they do need to get themselves to the hospital within the next hour or so. You might think it would be obvious and that a woman should know if her membranes are ruptured or not. And if there's been a gush and lots of fluid leaks out suddenly, it is obvious. But if the fetal head is well into the pelvis, then only a little bit of fluid is available to leak out because the fetal head acts like a plug. Then whenever the woman changes position or the fetus moves, a little quantity of fluid can leak out and a little more later and a little more later and she may not be sure where it's coming from. In the latter part of pregnancy, when the fetal head is directly over the bladder, any jarring move or driving over a bump in the road can cause a little bit of urine to escape. The urethra and the vagina are in close proximity and fluid leaking from one may feel the very same as fluid leaking from the other. Often women are not sure where the wetness is coming from and then we have to use pH paper or a microscope slide to observe for ferning to know for sure. In that case we use a sterile speculum since membranes may have ruptured to collect the vaginal secretions. Let's talk about preterm premature rupture of the membranes versus premature rupture of the membranes. Notice the difference between the two. You will see these initials beside names of patients in labor and delivery if their status indicates. Page 941 shows a partogram. Note the B portion of the illustration, the normal links of the nulla versus multipara labors. Precipitous labors might sound nice to the uninitiated since the entire labor and birth process is over in three hours, but it's actually likely to cause tearing in maternal tissue and even cranial trauma in the baby. Let's look at dystocia. Uh, cephalopelvic disproportion or CPD can occur if the fetus is too large or the pelvis is too small. Malposition can cause a dystocia if the baby is sunny side up, as we say, face up, an OP or occiput posterior position because the head is not usually tucked so well and the diameter is not as small as when the baby is born in an LOA or ROA position. Malpresentations can also cause dystocia, but in many cases when we determine that the fetus is not in a favorable position, a cesarean may be done. In a multigravita with a smaller fetus and an experienced cl clinician, a breech or a face presentation may be attempted. Inductions. Inductions may be done for medical or OB reasons, such as preeclampsia, diabetes, chorioamnionitis, post-term pregnancy, etc. Elective inductions are controversial, however. The mother or doctor may decide to induce for convenience. I have heard many women say in their third trimester, I'm just so tired of being pregnant, can't we induce? And if it was after 37 weeks, sometimes they would go ahead. But nature does not like to be hurried, and sometimes inductions aren't very successful. Sometimes the cascade of intervention in an induction can lead to a cesarean. Let's talk about the Bishop score. Know that it measures the likelihood of a successful induction. You don't actually have to memorize every point in it. 
time and natural processes naturally ripen or soften the cervix. If the cervix isn't ready, it may not respond well to oxytocin or other means of initiating contractions. There are three medications that help to ripen the cervix, and you will probably see one or two of them in clinical. The misoprostol tablet, which is prostaglandin E1, is broken into four pieces, and one of the pieces is inserted into the vaginal fornix, which is the area between the cervix and the vaginal wall. There is also prostaglandin E2, either in gel form or impregnated into what I have had students describe as something that looks like a shoestring. It is inserted into the fornix and removed once labor is well established. A foley also can be inserted into the cervix and inflated as a mechanical means of sort of forcing the cervix to become ripe. Also laminaria tents and lamicell are in wide use. The most common method of induction is amniotomy used with oxytocin. That usually shows up on the test. The cervix must be open enough, however, to allow access to the membranes. The head needs to be well down next to the cervix to prevent cord prolapse. Temperature should be checked every two hours once the membranes are no longer intact. Membrane stripping is often used as a way to increase or start contractions. Again, the cervix has to be open to do it. The nurse or midwife inserts a gloved finger through the cervix and between the intact bag of waters and the uterine wall, they make a circular motion. This loosens the membranes from the wall and apparently causes a release of endogenous prostaglandins. Oxytocin. The posterior pituitary puts out two hormones, oxytocin and ADH, or antidiuretic hormone. Both men and women make oxytocin, and it causes the uterus to contract in those of us who have them. We are not sure what it does in those of you who do not have a uterus, but some authorities think it may be responsible for the strong protective urge that both male and female parents feel toward their children. It is really useful to have Pitocin, a synthetic version of oxytocin, and we use it to induce contractions, augment labor, and in the postpartum to contract the uterus and prevent or treat postpartum hemorrhage. There are a number of reasons not to give it before birth. For instance, if a cesarean section is planned, remember that it is artificial and it increases the oxytocin levels and it can stress the uterus and the fetus as well. Some practitioners are beginning to use it more cautiously than they have done in the past and are giving it only enough to maintain a natural labor pattern of contractions. Giving it slowly and at the lowest dose possible would go a long way toward preventing adverse reactions. You need to know the hazards. Water intoxication is one. Interestingly enough, the other posterior pituitary hormone is ADH, and oxytocin can act as it does, preventing elimination from the intravascular space. The urine output drops, yet the woman has too much circulating volume. Other main adverse reactions relate to uterine hyperstimulation, which is too strong contractions. Uterine rupture, premature placental rupture, etc. may occur with resultant fetal compromise. If uterine hyperstimulation occurs, it is the responsibility of the nurse to stop the infusion and then call the clinician. See the nurse alert, page 951. You will see Pitocin drips frequently in L&D. We start at a low IV rate and increase the rate every few minutes. Six milliunits per minute is often a successful dose, though many times it is higher. Page 952 mentions augmentation of labor methods such as oxytocin induction, amniotomy, and nipple stimulation, but rightly encourages non-invasive techniques first like changing position, walking, relaxation techniques, and water therapy, showers, tubs, etc. You will hear the term active management of labor if you go to a teaching hospital for clinical, no doubt. The goal in active management is delivery within 12 hours of admission. That can make labor very intense and epidurals are almost a necessity. Forceps or vacuum may be used to hasten second stage.
We are getting away from the use of forceps these days, and even lately, vacuum-assisted birth is declining.